Welcome once again to At Home Sunday School and our Bible study of the Sunday School lessons for this year. We are winding down in the Sunday School year. As I'm recording this, we only have a couple of weeks left, but because we got behind, we actually have four lessons left, this one and then three more before our series will come to a conclusion. So this is lesson 30. And we are in the midst of a four lesson period of time in Jesus' parables. In lesson 29, we looked at Jesus' parable of the loving Samaritan. And today we consider Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant. And as we see, as we will see when we go into the Bible text, there are really two different scenes in this parable, I guess maybe three. First, and this is the um, I gotta get my size right. This is the scene that's over here, over this shoulder of the servant and the king. The king is settling debts with the servant. Then over on the other side is that same servant. The artwork doesn't portray exactly the same servant, but the same servant going out to his fellow servant here and demanding a payment of debt. And the third scene, as we'll see in this parable, is what happens after that first servant demands payment from the second servant. There's a little bit of a hint, oops, again, the wrong side, a little bit of a hint of that. If you look, this guy is the one that's being demanded of the debt. And then this is one that's demanding it. And then this one over here is a fellow servant who sees what's happening. And the fellow servants coming and dealing with that is the third scene. But we'll look at all of that as we make our way through the text. And the text for this lesson is found in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Before we turn our attention to that, let's continue with prayer. Lord Jesus, we, like your disciples, wish to come to your feet and learn from you. As you teach us this parable today, use its truth to reach into our hearts as well. Help us to learn from it and to grow from it in our faith, our appreciation for the forgiveness of sins that you give to us, and then also an ever-increasing willingness to be forgiving to others. We pray for your rich blessing as we study in your word today. Amen. So with that, let's turn then to the shared document and the text, and we'll jump over to this. So again, same picture, we see the two servant scenes as we'll see play out here as we make our way through. So we start, oh, first of all, before that, we in the earlier two lessons, um, we have uh, looked at a couple of parables uh, throughout the year this year, one most recently last time. And I won't continue to recap the general approach to parables each time, um, but I wanna just hit, hit a few key notes again this lesson and then um, we'll just move forward in the next lessons without worrying too much about this, but just to reiterate and to refresh our memories and to be reminded that as we approach the parables of Jesus, they're great teaching stories. And we want to um, get as much out of them as we can. And we want to do so in a way that is consistent with a proper understanding of parables. So just to recap a few of these things, earthly stories with heavenly meanings, the things in nature are found in Jesus' parables, but they themselves do not lead us to God. The parable, the story part of this, is just a vehicle for getting to the truth of God's word. That's number one. Uh, God himself must give us the key of understanding, and he does that through his word. So we can't make it up. We want to see what is, what is God's intention of having this written for us. What was Jesus' teaching point? as he first told this parable. Three parts to most parables, the, back, the background information of the situation that leads to the parable and the narrative that tells the account of the, the story, and then the spiritual lesson. And today's parable breaks into these three categories very easily. And it's very clear, a, a three part um, parable application and so on. And then a few observations as well. Parables have many details, but one intended meaning and lesson. Beware of the local color um, to help in the understanding of the everyday aspect of the parable. No parable should be ever be explained in a way that is contrary to clear teaching from God's word elsewhere. No parable should be used as a starting point for doctrine. 
be rather it can be used to um, confirm and illustrate something from another part of scripture but we can't rightfully establish doctrine based on a parable alone and before we attempt to explain the individual parts of the parable we should try to grasp the central truth and that central truth is what we want to focus on because a person can get too carried away with trying to assign the details for every aspect of the earthly story particularly if Jesus doesn't. If Jesus assigns this detail means this, this detail means that, great. But if he doesn't give us that detailed point-by-point -point explanation, we want to stay focused largely on the main idea of the parable, the main truth, rather than get too sidetracked with all the details where we might start applying things that aren't really in the text. Almost invariably, Jesus' explanations of his parables, introductions, summary statements, and so forth, will provide the key to the proper understanding. And if we can't quite grasp the fullness of a parable's meaning, we take what we can, and down the road, perhaps, the Spirit will lead us to a better or greater understanding um, in the future. So we, with that, we can turn then to the actual text from Matthew chapter 18. I do have this color coded uh, today. So the blue is the first part of the parable account. So that's, I could actually do this too. I didn't think of this earlier. We can make this correspond to the um, coloring later on. So the background information situation is in blue. The narrative is going to be in black and the spiritual lesson is going to be color coded in green. And then that matches down here. Before getting into the um, even the background here in verse 21, just a note of context a little bit earlier in chapter 18 is where Jesus gave the direction to the disciples, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And then it grows from there. So um, the, the private sharing of that sin and um, loving rebuke and correction if he doesn't listen, then bring another one or two with you. If he doesn't listen, then take it to the larger group, to the, to the church. It's in that context of Jesus bringing up, what do you do when someone sins against you, that then leads to Peter's question that leads into this parable. So Jesus had talked about what, how you approach someone privately and then go from there if you have someone sin against you. And then Peter comes and says to him, to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? That's the question that ultimately prompts this parable. How many times do I have to forgive my brother if he sins against me? And this could refer to blood brother, such as Andrew was to Peter, but it can also refer to a, a brother in a more generic sense, not necessarily a blood brother in the family, but a brother, someone else. And this is a pretty, pretty applicable question to us, too. We'll talk more about this a little bit later, but how often do I have to forgive someone for doing the exact same thing? I mean, I, okay, I can understand forgiving somebody once, maybe twice, but they keep on doing it all the time. How often do I have to keep being patient? How often do I have to forgive? That's really what Peter's question was. And then he throws out a number, as many as seven times. This is kind of the typical um, rabbinic understanding of the day, seven times, um, was above and beyond that. So it was by Peter saying seven times, he was being generous. Undoubtedly, he thought, well, you know, I know Jesus is going to want me to be forgiving. So maybe I, I'm supposed to forgive three, four times, whatever it might be. But I'll say seven. Um, seven times, Jesus, is that enough? I've kind of gone the extra mile. That's a lot. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. And depending on what Bible translation you're most familiar with, the second number that Jesus gives might sound a little low. Some translations translate this rather than 77 times, 70 times seven, so 490 times. And either translation works, it's a, it's a textual question, and it's not crucial to the understanding of the question, Jesus' answer, or the parable. Either way, whether Jesus' response is 77 times or 490 times ultimately, the message is the same. Peter, don't even keep count. I'm saying to you, forgive. Not, don't keep track. 
Don't cut it off after seven or eight or even 77 or even 70 times seven. Just keep on forgiving. And that truth that there's no cap, number one is implied here. Jesus just makes the number a little bit of a play on words. Peter's seven times? No, 70 times seven or 77 times. Just keep going, Peter. Keep on forgiving. So it's evident in Jesus' answer, but also as we make our way through the parable, it's also very clear that Jesus' point is there is no cap to our forgiveness of other people. We should not keep score and absolutely not cap our forgiveness after a certain number. So this is an example where there is a little bit of a variation in terms of the text and how this is translated, but we don't need to let that kind of variation upset us or lead us to doubt the validity of God's word in scripture because it doesn't affect the truth of God's word at all. Jesus, the, the essence of Jesus' answer is very, very clear, regardless of which of those two numbers we would use. This is a, a, a real issue. We'll look at this a little bit more, too. We already mentioned it a little bit in terms of how, how forgiving do I need to be? And it gets to the heart of how much or in what way do I appreciate the forgiveness that God has given me through Christ Jesus? It's an important enough point that Jesus not only answers Peter's question in verse 22, but then he goes on to tell this parable to further illustrate, explain, and shore up that answer. It's a good indication that this is a crucial question for us too. And if we consider our own hearts at times can be quite unforgiving, we understand the necessity of Jesus um, speaking these words to Peter and also having them recorded for us. That's the background. That's the lead up to the parable and the cause for Jesus speaking this parable. Now we take a look at the parable itself. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared. Kingdom of heaven, a reminder, we've looked at this before too, but a reminder that the kingdom of heaven is not just heaven, our eternal home. The kingdom of heaven is, we are in it right now. The citizens of Jesus' kingdom are all those who have him ruling in their hearts and lives by faith. So believers living out their lives on this earth are in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is our king. We are his citizens. We're living away from home right now, traveling through a foreign land. Heaven is our home, but we are in that kingdom of heaven. We are in Jesus' kingdom even now. So as we saw in an earlier parable, when Jesus uses a parable to illustrate the kingdom of heaven, it can be illustrating different facets of what it means to be a believer. What will happen in our lifetimes in this earth or how God does his work in the world. And then ultimately, it also can include eternal life in heaven. So in this case, uh, Jesus is speaking this parable for those in the kingdom of heaven and how do we as believers in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of Christ, interact with one another with forgiveness? Remember Peter's question, how many times should I forgive my brother? Here's my answer, as being members of Christ's kingdom, as living under his rule and reign by faith, here's how this plays out. This is the truth that you should carry with you in the kingdom of heaven. So that is the lead in, Jesus is saying, I'm describing your life as a child of God. And I'm applying my truth to your life as a child of God. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, this life under Christ's rule, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one servant was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Let's take a look, first of all, at what kind of monetary value we're talking about with this talent, with these talents, the 10,000 talents. I mentioned in an earlier lesson that it can be difficult to assign a clear monetary value to a talent. It was a weight of either silver or gold in those days. And depending on the price of silver or gold, it would have a different value. And silver, a silver talent being less valuable than a gold talent. But for the sake of this parable, it does help to have at least a broad idea of what kind of money we're talking about 
to help compare the debt in the two scenes with the two servants. So a couple of different approaches to determine a, a benchmark of sorts for this talent value. Approach number one says, okay, the talent is the largest weight among Hebrews for gold and silver. So in the days of Caesar Augustus, the Roman government typically made 84 denarii per pound of silver. Later, when Emperor Nero was ruling, he devalued the denarius by making about 96 of them out of a pound of silver. And we know from other parables and descriptions in the Bible that a denarius was, we can say it was a day's wage. The exact amount would rise or fall, but effectively a day's wage. So for those of you that like math, here we go. So we have 96 days of work, um, or I'm sorry, 90, 96 denarii, days, um, a day's of work, a day's wage. So we're using the Nero value. Um, just using the least expensive, the least valuable. So we use Nero's value. So 96 days worth of work times 75 pounds, which was the amount per talent. So 75 pounds of silver per talent of silver, the 96 days work in each pound and 10,000 talents, that's the debt. So if we just for the sake of easy numbers, um, plug in $100 per day for a day's wage, 96 days of that per pound times 75 pounds per talent times 10,000 talents of debt would equal $7.2 billion of debt in today's money. It's a huge debt, give or take a billion. Approach number two is uh, does end up being a little bit lower and it is a demonstration. There's a number of ways you can do this and depending on what source you look to, the value and the weight of a talent might vary. The point of looking at these two approaches is to show that no matter how you do it, you come up with a big, big number. So the second approach is that a talent was equal to about 20 years of labor. So if you take 20 years times, and again, just a easy number, $25,000 a year as salary uh, times 10,000, uh, again, 10,000 talents, you end up with 5 billion. So it's only 2.2 billion less. That's a lot of money between these two, but in ju that's just a benchmark. Either way, and these numbers are probably, I didn't look up what the average um, daily wages or the average, annual salary across our country. These numbers are probably tend toward the little bit of the low side. And even if it was half of the second approach, you'd still be talking two and a half billion dollars. So we are talking billions of dollars of debt in this first servant. So as we, and again, one other, just wanted to reiterate one more time, the exact amount isn't crucial. The point of the parable, the point we need for the parable is this was a huge, huge debt. And we'll see it in comparison to the other debt. That comparison is also important. But look at, so let's just say $5 billion. Look at the absolute futility of paying that debt. Now, it's not important to the parable how the servant racked up that kind of debt and would he ever have the means to pay it back. But that huge of a debt, and based on the servant's response, it's just entirely impossible to pay that debt. Even as the king commands to sell his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made, even still, $5 billion or more, dollars, it, would it make him debt free? Most likely not. The point in the parable is that this is an unpayable debt. It's huge. And you could spend a lifetime paying it down and never really actually accomplish full payment. And just to make, again, Jesus doesn't go into this detail, but if you were having interest added on to that, you just never catch up. It's a huge debt and not payable. So we wanna keep that in mind. The first servant's debt is huge and an unpayable debt. He cannot pay it. So the servant falls on his knees and implores the king, have patience with me, and I will pay everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. Completely gone. Now, 
again, we want to keep this in our minds and let this soak in the huge debt, $5 billion, gone. In one command of the king, the entire debt is gone. It's not a grace period. It is not, I'll give you an extra two years to pay for it. It's not, I'll make you a deal. You, you pay half, I'll pay the other half. It is complete and thorough forgiveness of the entire debt. It's an incredible gift. Sometimes people get pretty excited about um, winning uh, a certain amount of money for, uh, for whatever reason. I just heard this last week, one of the radio stations locally is giving away $1,000 a number of times during the day. And I happened to hear somebody excited about the $1,000. That's a lot of money and certainly um, kind of exciting to just be, have that given to you. But this is a $5 billion debt remove. It's like winning $5 billion effectively. And just an incredible, incredible gift. It is the gift of a forgiveness of an unpayable debt. I'm gonna keep that in mind for the spiritual application. The first servant was forgiven an unpayable debt. And um, just a couple of things here too in the, in the bullets, the, the servant says, patience, have patience with me, I'll pay everything. Yeah, the, the, the king could have patience, but really pay everything? Seems pretty unlikely. And how God, or how Jesus describes rather the, the masters of the king's pity on him is translated as pity, literally it's to be moved in your gut or in your intestines. We've talked about it before that in the Hebrew and then also in the early New Testament days, the in the Greek, the, um, the seat of emotions or where you would feel emotions is described as being in your stomach, in your gut, in your intestines, and in your midsection. And it really is more um, common in our day to say about our, our heart. But if you think about where do you feel nervousness, for example, your heartbeat might go up. But if you feel nervous, we talk about butterflies in your stomach, you feel a little sick to your stomach because I'm so nervous. Or I, maybe people um, worry about things and they get stressed out and they feel that stress. And it's not really happening in your heart so much. It's more in the pit of your stomach. Sometimes people don't even eat because they're so worried or so stressed out. So the, the Greeks and the Hebrews portray this emotional place in you as being your gut. And literally now this man, this king, was moved with compassion in his, in, his, in his innards, in his gut, in his stomach. He felt sorry for the guy. And he had compassion. Like, oh, you, know, you are in an unpay, un, un, unsolvable situation. You won't be able to pay this debt. It's huge. And as a result of that compassion and pity, forgives the whole thing right there on the spot. End of scene one in Jesus' parable. Scene two, verse 28. But when that same servant went out, so he just had the billions of dollars forgiven, he leaves the king's presence. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. I'm just going to jump down here and look at what that value is. So a denarius is a day's wage. And denarii is plural of denarii. So again, the same approach as what we did up above. Approach number one, 100 denarii would be multiplied by $100 a day, it gives you $10,000. So using the same approach, the same rough formula, $10,000 versus $7.2 billion. $10,000 is a lot of money, but not in comparison to $7.2 billion. Or if we, excuse me, if we prefer to use approach two, again, it's very similar. 100 denarii times $80 a day is what that works out to, 8,000 versus 5 billion. Again, the numbers are, you know, they fluctuate, but the biggest thing is the contrast. A sizable debt, sure, but not compared to the big debt. So this fellow servant who just had billions of dollars forgiven goes and finds this fellow servant who owes him several thousand and begins to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. We take a look at the comparison now between these two servants. The first servant, when you use 5 billion as the amount versus 8,000, very different. 
a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. A fair enough request. A fair enough request. And when one servant came, and he owed him the ten thousand talents. This compared with a king settling accounts versus the servant seizing him, beginning to choke him, saying, "Pay what you owe." The whole approach is different. The demeanor is different. The way it is presented is different. All of this is showing Jesus' excellency in parable construction as well. First servant says to the king, have patience with me, I'll pay you everything. Second servant says to the first servant, have patience with me and I will pay you. The exact same words. The response of the king, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him, forgave him the debt. Versus he refused and went to put him in prison until he should pay the debt. And so this $8,000 becomes in many ways unpayable because if you're in prison, how will you pay the debt? A very different debt tilted um, larger to the first servant, a very different response also tilted largely to the first servant, pity to forgive the huge debt, no pity to forgive the the small debt. End of scene two, the second servant. Now the third scene is the reaction of the fellow servants. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt, billions of dollars, because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. That is the end of that first servant in the now in the third section of this, of the third scene in this parable. And it's easy to see why the um, why the first servants would react in the, the other servants, rather, the, the fellow servants of the first servant would react in this way. How unjust, how horrible, <clears throat> excuse me, to React that way when you yourself had just had such a huge debt forgiven. And in this parable, this is the beauty of the parable, and it's perhaps no more clear than in this particular parable, the contrast. It is not hard to see and be angry, really, with that first servant. What an ungrateful servant he was. But when we start to apply this spiritually, we understand how when we are ever, if we are ever unforgiving towards somebody else, how ungrateful we are. And that spiritual application convicts us, reminds us of the forgiveness of sins that we have. And so if we, if we put the application then to this parable, that huge unpayable debt is our sin. We are the first servant. Now, we who have had such a huge, huge debt, an unpayable debt, something we could never get out of on our own, if we've had all of our sins forgiven by God, our King, then how could we ever rightly be unforgiving towards someone else? It doesn't mean that the other people's sins against us don't hurt. They do. And it can be hurt that at times can take days, weeks, months, years, even a lifetime of dealing with, depending on how badly someone has hurt us. It doesn't mean that when someone sins against us that their sin is somehow not serious or diminished. Our forgiveness of someone else doesn't change the sin at all, but it is a response that is from us responding to those who sin against us in a way that is similar to how God has forgiven us and responded to us. Look again at this contrast out of pity, the master released him, forgave him the debt versus refusing to forgive, puts him in prison until he should should pay the debt. If God behaved toward us in the same way that we at times behave toward others in not wanting to forgive them, begrudgingly forgiving them, maybe only forgiving them in words and not really wanting to at all, if God handled it that way with us, we'd be doomed. We who have had so much forgiven have every reason to forgive others. 
yeah, but our sinful flesh comes in. Yeah, but yeah, I was really wrong. He really hurt me. Why do I need to forgive him? Lord, should I forgive him seven times? 70 times seven. Keep on forgiving. Yeah, but that's a, but he keeps doing it. It hurts and it's a lot. Sure enough. But no matter, and, and again, not to diminish how much it can hurt if someone sins against us, but no, no matter what anyone does against you, it is tiny, like $10,000 versus $7.2 billion. Whatever anyone does to you, even if it's repetitive and very hurtful, still tiny compared to everything that we do in sin against God. Huge debt forgiven because Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. Small debt that somebody else owes us because they sinned against us, forgive, even as we have been forgiven. So Jesus makes that application in the last verse of our text, now in the green, because we're now in that third part of the application, in the spiritual truth. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. A lack of forgiveness towards someone else is evidence of a lack of appreciating with thanksgiving the forgiveness that God has given to you. It is not, oh, let's just jump down to this paragraph. This is the next note. So we want to consider God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others in the light of this parable. This is not a one-for-one trade-off. When Jesus says at the end, if you do not forgive your brother from the heart, the Father will do to every one of you. It's not setting up a situation where you forgive a sin of somebody else, God forgives one of your sins. You forgive, God forgives. You forgive, God forgives. And back and forth. If it were that, we would never, ever catch up because our sins against God are so many more. It's also not a situation where you are earning God's forgiveness by forgiving somebody else. Jesus isn't saying that either. And this is why this parable really helps us understand this relationship between our forgiving other people and God's forgiving of us. If, and because we can see, we can, we can understand that that first servant just had no business trying to get that $10,000 debt from his fellow servant after he had billions of dollars forgiven. We understand that. Now we just need to apply that to our lives and our spiritual lives. The, if, let's just say that that um, first servant was forgiving to his fellow servant. That second servant didn't earn the forgiveness it was a gift to him, just like the first servant was forgiven was a gift. But had that first servant forgiven his fellow servant, it would have been an act of love and mercy and pity, just like he had received. No earning on anybody's part. And that's how this works with our forgiveness. God forgives us our huge, huge debt. And so that then prompts us to be forgiving to others. And if we're not forgiving to others, that is an indication that we haven't really fully grasped through faith the forgiveness that God has given us. That doesn't mean that we won't at times struggle with it. We are still sinful, and so we do struggle with it. And just because I may harbor for a bit uh, an unforgiving spirit, maybe even just for a small bit, I don't, I'm so angry, I don't want to forgive you. That doesn't mean that we have suddenly lost the forgiveness of God, but what we want to do is recognize that that lack of forgiveness towards somebody else is sin. You want to understand that if I harbor ill will or an unforgiving spirit toward anyone, that is sinful. And by doing so, I am not showing thankfulness and gratitude to God for the forgiveness of all my sin and my huge debt. And then we understand that as a sin and we we repent of that too and know that it's forgiven through the blood of Christ. A parallel passage here at the bottom of the screen right now is uh, 1 John 4. We love because he first loved us. Our forgiveness of others is showing them love, whether they love us in return or not. Our forgiveness of others is showing them love, just as God first showed us love. His love prompts our love. His forgiveness prompts our forgiveness. Another passage is um, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Again, God's love and forgiveness of us is what prompts our forgiving others. All of this is tied into the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. And what's on the screen is from Luther's explanation of that in the small catechism. 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Again, not a, not a one-to-one. -one. God forgive me as I forgive, so I forgave five, you forgive five. Not that way. But God forgive us our trespasses and then have that move us, your love and forgiveness to move us to forgive others their trespass against us. Martin Luther described it and explained it this way. We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look on our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We're not worthy of things for which we are asking, neither have we deserved them. However, we ask that our Father would, by his grace, give us what we ask, even though we sin often every day and indeed deserve nothing but punishment. In Luther's explanation, these first four lines deal with our relationship with God. He forgave us even though we're not worthy. He forgave us even though we don't deserve it. He forgave us even though we couldn't rescue ourselves. He forgave us even though we deserve punishment. And then the last line is how this plays out in our lives. Because that's all true, we too will from our hearts gladly forgive and do good to all those who sin against us. Different from what that second, or excuse me, what the first servant did to the second servant. Different than what Peter first had in mind when he asked the initial question as well. So we put it all together, a few lesson keys. Peter's question is one that we can all understand. We can grow impatient and not want to forgive others. And Jesus' answer is one that we can all remember to apply. Yeah, I may get impatient. And yes, I may find myself needing to forgive you again and again. You're going to have to forgive me again and again, for sure. But above all of that, think of how often God forgives us. I can understand my impatience. But what if God dealt with me that way? God deals with me so differently. That moves me to deal differently with my um, whoever sins against me. So Jesus' parable identifies our impatience, our hurt, our unwillingness to forgive. And again, that's in sharp contrast with God, who would have every reason to be impatient with us. I can't believe they did the same sin again for the 453rd day. God is incredibly patient with us and forgives us because Jesus died for our sins. Think of every argument we might have to be unforgiving toward others and consider how God could easily use the same arguments against us and consider the grace that he shows by not doing so. And then consider God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others in the light of this parable. Again, it's not a one-for-one -one trade off, nor are we earning it, but God's forgiveness moves us to be forgiving. That is the takeaway of our forgiveness for others. If ever we need a reminder then of how and why we can be forgiving to others, if we find ourselves in a position of uh, feeling unforgiving toward others or being unforgiving toward others, remember this parable. Remember how obvious it is in the parable, that wicked servant. And then remember, well, that's me. If I'm going to harbor ill will and bitterness and a lack of forgiveness toward anyone else, because God has forgiven me that unbelievable debt of my sin, forgave it totally, completely free, and not one bit of it remains. That is a tremendous gift and one that we can then share with others as we are forgiving to them, just as God is forgiving to us. May God richly bless your time in his word.